Hello, folks. Welcome back to fascism in the interwar years. Now, where we ended up in the previous lecture is that Italy had unified in about 1870, but they didn't have a strong democratic tradition. So because they did not have a strong tradition, it was really hard to stick to that when times got really tough, which they did in the interwar years. So we have conservative landlords in the north, we have tension between the working class and the middle class, we have resentful veterans who thought Italy hadn't been treated fairly, we have the Great Depression, and so Mussolini steps up, um, I suppose we could call it that, and becomes a fascist dictator. <laughs> There's Mussolini. Where we get the term fascist from is the symbol of Mussolini's movement was the fascists, a bundle of birch rods bound together with an axe that was meant to represent strength and unity and came from original sort of ancient Rome stuff. Um, I apologize if there's a lot of noise in the background as well. I don't know why, but the children and the dogs in my neighborhood have all decided that right now is a great time to start making all the noises. Sorry. So there's the fascist Italian flag. And here are some propaganda posters encouraging people to unify together for Italy, and specifically fascist Italy, where on the left you can see we're appealing to men and masculinity, and then on the other side, on the left, oh, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. On the left we have the masculinity, and on the right we have the, we're the sweet feminine woman and we support united fascist Italy. So, more fascism, less gelato, which is very tragic. Mussolini promised reform, but instead he just sort of consolidated his own power. This is what basically all dictators do is they're like, we're gonna fix all of the problems. Just kidding. We're just going to take advantage of you for our own personal gain, usually. So Mussolini suspended democracy. That's fun. When you suspend democracy and you enter into a full dictatorship, these are some of the classic signs. So getting rid of political opposition. Because if you have no political opponents, opposition, you, you know, if nobody is telling you that you're doing something bad, then you must be doing something good, right? Well, there's nobody there to tell you you're doing something bad. So essentially, this is getting rid of anybody who disagrees with you. Um, usually, dictators and fascism and stuff like that does this by um, execution, imprisonment, or exile, usually. So good examples of this are in Stalinist Russia, where he used the Red Terror time in the 1930s to execute people or send them off to gulags far, far away, where usually they would eventually just sort of die. Another one is to um, suppress or to get rid of, I don't think that says suppress. <laughs> Shh, I don't remember how to spell suppress. Let me live. Nothing works anymore during this pandemic. Um, suppress any kind of other groups that could lobby for change, other groups of dissent. Dissent is when you disagree. So this includes things like labor unions, people who get together to talk about working conditions, um, any kinds of political parties, any kinds of activists. These tend to get dissolved when you have some kind of a fascist dictatorship. Um, and then sort of lastly is silencing the press and censoring education and the arts. So you will see in a lot of um, dictatorships, you're not allowed to watch certain movies, you're not allowed to read certain books, you're not allowed to talk about certain topics. In school, the press isn't allowed to say certain things. Like we were talking about with World War I, the reason it became called the Spanish flu was because Spain was the only government during wartime that was not actively silencing the press. So 
Cultural fascism in Italy emphasizes Catholicism because that has been Italy's main religion. I mean, for goodness sake, the Pope lives there for several thousand years. Um, the emphasis on women is that they their only job is to be domestic and maternal. Make those babies so we can send them off to war. And then also at the same time, they conquered Ethiopia because why not? Ethiopia's like, I know why not. <laughs> Italy's like, well, tough. So here are some little boys doing the Tsikaya. All right, so Nazi Germany. Where did Nazi Germany come from? It didn't just come out of nowhere. They just popped out of the snow like daisies. No, they popped out of the Treaty of Versailles, and not so much like daisies as much as weeds. So after the Treaty of Versailles, we get what's called the Weimar Republic. The Weimar Republic is kind of sort of created by the Treaty of Versailles, and it is not successful, but it's not necessarily its fault that it's not successful. Because again, just like Italy, Germany really does not have strong democratic traditions. They really don't. They have strong traditions of strong leaders taking power when they can. So the Weimar Republic is faced with trying to uphold democracy in an area that isn't very interested in democracy. They're trying to deal with the fallout from the Treaty of Versailles. Specifically, that Germany in particular has a ton of resentment. Resentment. Veterans are being treated poorly and are feeling awful. <laughs> One more. <laughs> so sorry. Ooh. Um, it's because it's spring, yo. It's not the Rona. Um, another portion of this is that because of reparations and having to pay back all of this money to Europe, the German economy has tanked. They have, like, zero dollars. All those jokes about, like, we could be using the money to try and go buy a loaf of bread, or we could just use it as toilet paper because they're worth about the same. And toilet paper is more effective. So they're trying to deal out deal with the fallout from the Treaty of Versailles, from economic disasters, essentially. A huge economic recession, partially brought on by the Great Depression. But then also, they are struggling with this resentment from all of these other groups, and they're not able to rebuild Germany the way that they would want to because they have no money. So because they have all of this resentment, and they have no money, and there's this huge depression, and they can't really seem to manage to rebuild Germany because no money. Essentially what this leads to is misery, unemployment, anger, frustration, and the desire to blame somebody. Very few people want to take responsibility for their own actions. And to be perfectly fair, there's lots of outside forces going into Germany's situation in the interwar years. A lot of it comes from this Treaty of Versailles. But instead of blaming the British or the French or even necessarily their own republic, though they do plenty of that, the Germans decide to blame the Jewish people by and large. So that's a choice that will eventually lead to the death of at least six million people, which is horrifying on so, so many ways. All of this means that the Germans are looking for a scapegoat and they are also looking for a strong leader because they also feel that it's the weak leadership of the Weimar Republic that has led them into this disaster. So they are looking for a strong leader 
to come in and fix everything. And again, this is something you often hear from dictators is you hear them say things like, only I can fix it, or I have to do these things in order to fix the problems. So I know you really want a free press, but if we have a free press, then we can't unify like we need to and turn our country around and you know make it all better. So what strong leader do we get? Oh, we get Hitler. I say we, I don't mean we. I was not there. I would not be interested in that. Thank you very much. Um, Hitler creates the National Socialist Workers' Party, German Workers' Party, which gets squeezed down to Nazi. And I would like to be very, very clear that National Socialism is not the same as Democratic Socialism. Democratic Socialism is where the government takes over specific parts of um, the economy in order to provide a better overall service for its citizens. So for example, college education, healthcare, um, stuff like that. These um, democratic socialism is what you see in countries like Great Britain, like France, like Sweden, like Norway, like Germany today. National socialism is where the government takes over lots of sections of the um, of society and the economy, but with a specific ultra nationalistic what's the word I'm looking for, agenda in mind. So they're taking over the army. They're taking over entertainment and literature and the arts to promote this ultra-nationalistic agenda, which then in turn leaves other people out in the cold. And um, when they're looking for someone to blame and everybody's really angry, that usually leads to death. So the Nazis aren't popular at first. In 1928, they only had 2.6% of the vote. Oh, but what happens in 1929? Oh, it's the Great Depression. So after just a couple of years of Germany being in an even worse economic position than they had been, the Nazis win 37% of the vote. In 1933, Hitler becomes the Chancellor of Germany, and he just sort of straight up takes over, and he creates the Third Reich. Reich just means like age or era. The first Reich is the Holy Roman Emperor Empire because they are trying to draw on the glorious tradition of a past time period of strength and unity and beautiful patriotism. And then the second Reich is Germany from 1871 to 1918 when they were unified and they were strong and they were winning so much winning and then you'll notice that there is the third reich comes after the weimar republic they also start violating the treaty of versailles by doing things like building up the army and eyeballing poland poor poland <laughs> so here is an example of kind of what we were talking about these are an example of like a soup line that you might see. There's a lot of pictures that I haven't included in this that you can very easily look up. If you look up um, Deutschmarks and stuff like that, and remember to spell Deutsch like, like that. Um, that is the German word for German. If you look up like Deutschmarks, interwar years, Deutschmarks, 1930s, you'll see pictures of people, you know, wheeling full barrows full of money to try and go buy a loaf of bread. Children playing with money in the streets because it's so worthless. And there's Hitler. Okay. So is anti-Semitism new? No. Is it still bad? You bet. Let's talk about this. We've talked about it before, but it's always good to have a little bit of a refresher on where did anti-Semitism come from. So, like a lot of other communities in Europe, Jewish people tended to settle in their own neighborhoods, sort of separated out from everybody else. This is a very common tendency when you have a group of people moving into a new environment. They want to try and keep up their cultural traditions, and so they tend to group together, flock together, so that they can have a community to help keep up those traditions. A really good example is something like Chinatown, where you have a bunch of, um, to be fair, in a lot of Chinatowns in the United States, they were in fact restricted there by law, but um, you still see a lot of people living in places like Chinatown today because they're trying to keep up a lot of those cultural traditions from China. And so it's a lot easier to 
find the ingredients that you want for your traditional recipes in a neighborhood where everybody is looking for those same recipes and those same ingredients kind of a thing. Now I'm not saying that that's how it should be or anything like that. It just happens sometimes. And again, it's really only okay if it happens organically. Um, it's really not okay if the government says, hey, you have to be here. That's never really okay. That's just never okay. So Jewish people were settling in their own communities a little bit just because they were all Jewish and wanted to live together. Um, and they were also a lot cleaner than your sort of generic European at this time because Jewish religion includes a lot of like cleanliness habits like um, Islam does. Islam includes a lot of cleanliness habits as well. So they tended to get sick less. So uh, they uh, had the Black Death blamed on them. Europeans blamed the Black Death on them in a lot of communities because they were dying less. So therefore, they must be controlling it, right? No. They also would keep Jewish people out of certain professions, like being merchants. And so Jewish people wanted to still get a piece of the trade pie that was going on during that time period. So they became money lenders very often because money lenders usually are able to get a piece of that economic pie when you have really large amounts of trade, like the Atlantic trade that we're seeing in the 15 and 1600s. But then this caused a lot of other Europeans to resent them because they resented having to give money back, which again is kind of really stupid because you borrowed it in the first place. What did you think was going to happen? They were just going to forget about it and they're like, oh no, please have all this money just as a gift. So they were resented. Um, they were often seen as being different and the other, and that's never good either. English and French kings seized a lot of their property and committed pogroms. Pogroms are religious violence or violence against usually religious communities. So it doesn't necessarily have to be religious communities. It's just that usually when you see pogroms, it's violence against Jewish communities in specific. And then they would often push them into very bad neighborhoods called ghettos, which again is a really good reason not to use the word ghetto um, in a slang way, because if we're not talking about the Jewish ghettos, we're talking probably about the American ghettos that emerged in the 20th century, where because of laws or income inequality or segregation, people of color were disproportionately pushed into low-income neighborhoods, which then in turn saw much bigger amounts of violence and um, economic despair and drugs and stuff like that. And again, it's mostly because of racial discrimination, segregation, income inequality. So when you use the term ghetto to talk about, you know, how something isn't very nice, you're sort of drawing on this huge long history of discrimination and tragedy. So it's not really the best of terms to use. The Jewish people were also expelled from Spain. So got expelled more or less from England and France. So they moved to Spain. And then in, in 1492, Spain is like, no, thank you. So they go from Spain to the Ottoman Empire, where the Ottoman Empire says, you know, we like these printing presses, but we're not actually going to use them because you can only write in Arabic. Then they eventually move out of the Ottoman Empire to lots of different areas in Eastern Europe, specifically places like Russia, Ukraine, Germany, Austria-Hungary, areas like that. But again, they're not free from violence in these areas because they're still facing pogroms and stuff like that. So violence against Jewish people from the Muslim community, violence against Jewish people from European communities who they're being burnt as witches at the stake. Here's that nice graphic about the expulsion of Jewish people in Europe at large, and then here's one of them being corralled into ghettos. So we will talk a little bit more about this later. Sorry this lecture went a little bit long, but it's really hard to, you know, 
not spend your time to really talk about some of these issues in depth. We really can't gloss over fascism. We really can't gloss over violence against marginalized communities. It's just really important that we face these head on and that we face them in depth and with maturity. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate your efforts. I appreciate you, your wonderful, wonderful human beings or lizard people, whatever you would like. And I will see you in the next lecture.